In this lesson, we'll examine some general strategies for tackling math questions on the GMAT. Now, these strategies are based on two important facts. First, GMAT math questions are designed to test your number sense and your logic skills. They are not designed to test your ability to carry out lengthy calculations. In other words, the GMAT is not designed to identify and reward the human calculators out there. If anything, the test punishes people who choose to perform more calculations than are necessary. Second, almost all GMAT math questions can be solved using more than one approach. Now these two facts will have a significant effect on the way we approach math questions. To see how, let's begin with this relatively simple question. Here we see that Golf World sells golf balls for $4.15 each, and we want to determine the cost of 480 golf balls. Now the approach you learned in school was to multiply $4.15 by 480 to calculate the total cost. But doing this would probably fall under the heading of performing lengthy calculations, and we know that the GMAT is not designed to test our ability to perform lengthy calculations. We also know that most GMAT math questions can be solved by using more than one approach. So what are some other options here? Well, we might consider estimating here, but before we do this or try any other approach, we should always check the answer choices first, since doing so can often provide some insight into the best way to solve the question. Also, before we can use any estimation to solve a question, we must always check to see how spread apart the answer choices are. If the numbers are quite spread apart, then we can use estimation. In our case, the numbers are quite spread apart, so we can safely estimate here. So rather than use the original numbers, let's see how much it would cost to purchase 500 balls at $4 each. Well, 500 times $4 is $2,000, so our answer is approximately $2,000. Since only one of the five answer choices is even remotely close to $2,000, we know that C must be the correct answer. So by checking the answer choices first and seeing the numbers so spread apart, we were able to save ourselves considerable time. Now, what would we do if the answer choices weren't so spread apart? For example, what would we do if the answer choices were close together like this? Well, if we estimate here, we get an approximate answer of $2,000, but all of the answer choices are very close to 2000 in which case it's impossible to tell which is the correct answer. So we know that if the answer choices are spread apart, then we can save time by estimating. But what if the answer choices are very close together? In that case, plan A is to look for another approach, and failing that, plan B is to perform lengthy calculations. The good news is that there is almost always an approach that does not rely on lengthy calculations. Your job is to learn these approaches before test day. All right, let's look at some other questions. Now in school, you learned that to find 56% of 825, you can either multiply 0.56 by 825, or you can multiply 56 over 100 by 825. Now of course, both of these options require some somewhat lengthy calculations, so there's probably an easier and faster approach here. For example, can we estimate? Well, to answer that question, we must first check the answer choices. Since the first four answer choices are so close together, we really can't estimate. So we must find a different approach or perform the calculations we looked at earlier. Can you see a faster approach? Well, notice that it's relatively easy to see that 50% of 825 is 412.5. And since we want to find 56% of 825, we know that the correct answer must be greater than 412.5, which means we can eliminate answer choices A, B, and C. Also, since 100% of 825 is 825, we know that the correct answer must be less than 825, which means we can eliminate answer choice E. So we can see that the correct answer here must be D, and we didn't have to perform any lengthy calculations at all. Alright, now let's examine a trickier question. Here, we want to find the sum of numbers from 12 to 53. Now, of course, the long approach is to list all of the numbers and then add them together, but this could take a lot of time. 
Also, knowing what we know about GMAT math questions, we know that there must be at least one other approach here. Can you see one? Well, there are several possible approaches, but let's say we decide to add all of these numbers together, but we do so in pairs, starting from the outside and working in. For example, we'll add these two numbers to get 65. Then we'll add these two numbers to get 65, and we'll add these two numbers to get 65 as well. In fact, we can see that the correct answer here will be the sum of several 65s and perhaps one different number if there isn't an even number of numbers in our sum. Now, how many numbers are in the original sum? In other words, how many numbers are there from 12 to 53 inclusive? Well, in the word problems module, you will learn that the number of integers from x to y inclusive is equal to y minus x plus 1. So the number of integers from 12 to 53 will be 53 minus 12 plus 1, which equals 42. So if there are 42 numbers from 12 to 53, then we will have 21 pairs of numbers that add to 65. So at this point, we can find our answer by multiplying 21 by 65. Or we can recognize that if we did multiply 21 by 65, the unit digit of our product would be 5. And since only one answer choice has a unit digit of 5, then this must be the correct answer. Okay, that's enough for one lesson. Let's summarize. The important takeaways of this lesson are that you should not have to perform a lot of calculations on most GMAT math questions, and almost all questions can be solved using more than one approach. These two facts should have a significant effect on the way you take the GMAT and the way you prepare for the GMAT. So while you're practicing, you should always try to identify at least two approaches to every question. And while you're practicing, be sure to review the solutions to every question, even if you answered it correctly. There's always a chance that you will learn a faster way to solve the question.